one gene that we are looking at is a transcription factor called LHX2. What is a transcription factor? It's a protein that binds different parts of DNA selectively, different genes, and turns their expression on and off. So in some sense, it allows the books to be opened and read or not. Um, we found that this particular transcription factor is key in controlling in the hippocampus whether the cells will make neurons or whether they will make astrocytes. Okay. Um, in other parts of the brain, this transcription factor is key in controlling the arbors of the neuron. So a neuron is like a cell with input wires and an output wire. Now, the shape of this input wire, it's like an arbor of a tree. It's going to control how the neuron functions because it's going to control the reach of the neuron, how it integrates information. So knock out this transcription factor, the arbor changes. Shubha, thank you so much for agreeing to be a part of the Inductive Economy. It's an absolute privilege and an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so very much. Pleasure to be here. Really kind of you to invite me. Thank you so much, Shubha. So let's start with your early life and career. So, you know, um, you know, what was the most important moment, the defining moment or that inf moment of influence that really nudged you or nudged that spark to pursue neuroscience? Could you share a specific experience to kick things off? When did I think of neuroscience? Um, okay, I can tell you when I thought of neuroscience and I can tell you when the idea of a developing system, how the brain is formed, uh, mm. constructed. They, they were two kind of uh, episodes I remember. Um, the neuroscience one, I didn't know it was called neuroscience at the time, but I remember waking up from a vivid all-color dream Lots of things happened. I remembered colors of things. Um, I remembered sequences, conversations, everything. And I was chatting with my friends and I realized people don't necessarily dream like that. Everybody's dreams are different. And I think looking back, I mean, I didn't know it was neuroscience then. I was a schoolgirl. Uh, but looking back, I think that may have been the trigger of my wondering, how do people's brains produce this? Uh, you know, each of us, owns our dreams. We, you know, know them so well uh, or not. Maybe some people have deep dreamless sleeps, but how the brain produces. So that's neuroscience um, and development. I think my love for development came out of an argument. I okay. remember being in sixth standard. My mother, my wonderful mom, now no more, Aruna Tole, she was an occupational therapist and she was also she took a career break of seven years in which she trained to be a library scientist, a library science, um, excuse me. Uh, my wonderful mother, um, Aruna Tole, now no more, an occupational therapist by training, took a seven year career break. Uh, and during that, she trained in library science and actually worked at a school library um, through which she got to know all of the wonderful books and so on out there. And she began subscribing to a series called Understanding Science. And she began looking for um, these used copies of the Time Life Science series, uh, one called Growth. I remember there was a picture of a big hand and a little hand on the cover, uh, and one called Vision and one called Sound and so on. Um, but in the Understanding Science series, I remember reading that a chicken is created from a tiny disk of cells that float on top of the yolk. And that blew my mind because everybody thought that the yellow yolk becomes a yellow chicken. And I remember having this argument in sixth standard with my friends where they were like, no, that the yolk is what becomes a chicken. And I said, no, but I just read that the yolk is just food for the chicken. The fact that it's yellow is just, you know, it's yellow, but this disk of cells and there was no way I could explain it properly, nor could I convince them. But that is that is development. So I would think that that my love for development started there. <laughs> and in my career, I've combined the two. I study the development of the brain. So neurodevelopment is the name. 
Absolutely. And you know, it's great that you even brought up uh, your late mother because I remember reading in the Nature article about, you know, you wrote it very evocatively and uh, it inspired me to ask you this question that, you know, your mother wanted you to be a doctor growing up. And, you know, when you look back today, you know, you are an incredibly accomplished scientist. You're, uh, you yourself are a mother, you know, and uh, just just your thoughts on how much of our own parents' hopes and dreams we carry forward, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think our parents make a deep impact on us. Uh, and that's, that is the way uh, it's their job to actually um, raise us. So we carry forward our parents' um, thoughts and ideas in perhaps not necessarily obvious ways, some more obvious than others. I mean, if your parents insist on you becoming a doctor or an engineer and don't give you a choice and raise you to follow their dreams, then that's what you're going to do. Um, my parents taught me, to, taught me to think for myself and really take responsibility for myself. So the um, doctor part was simply my mother herself wanted to become a doctor. Financial constraints prevented her. She couldn't get the funding at that time and there was uh, no other way. Um, my father uh, saw me enjoying physics and math and uh, thought that, hey, I should go to an IIT and become an engineer. Now, um, at the time, uh, those two professions were the most desirable ways to sort of play out your love for either biology or physics. Uh, I must say very regretfully, even today, <laughs> parents think so. Uh, I think it's kind of tragic that at the age of 16, one should be sort of encouraged to think that a professional track is the only way to grow your curiosity and learning. I think it's tragic and I think our country has to do something about it. If nothing has changed in the course of my life, for example. Um, uh, so, so I, it was, it was a lovely Sunday, summer, summery Sunday that changed my life in some sense. St. Xavier's College, where I was uh, studying uh, 11th and 12th, had an exhibition conducted by the Life Science Department it's by Senior College. Um, Father Lancy Pereira, now no more, was the, the energy and life force and leader of this, this whole enterprise. Um, I remember walking into that room and I remember just completely seeing here was everything I wanted to study. They had how did life evolve? How did it start on Earth? Can it exist outside of Earth? Um, I was very fascinated with uh, uh, vision and uh, how the brain worked. And there was a giant picture of an eyeball talking about the physics of vision. It seemed to be everything I wanted to study. Um, and I'd met a lot of uh, doctors in my family, extended family and friends and so on. And I realized that I was very interested in how um, the body is, how the body comes to be what it is. Uh, and not that interested in um, helping people when they're ill. You have to have a good degree of wanting to do that, I think, if you want to be a physician. Uh, so I think some self-reflection. And I went home and told my mom that this is what I want to do. Um, my mom was absolutely cool with it. My father was cool with it. My father's uh, advice, actually, he said, you know, Shubha, if you know what you want to do, go for it. Um, if you're not exactly sure, he said, take a physics degree, because with that, you can do anything. And you know what? He was right. Today, I see my physics colleagues doing so many different things. The, the training of physics allows them um, a certain uh, set of mental tools, which they can then apply to anything. Um, so, yeah, um, I studied life sciences. I enjoyed physics and I'm bummed that our education system prevented me from having it for more than my first year. Um, but uh, having the quantitative sciences as part of biology would be something our country needs to incorporate in its undergrad education. Uh, I think it's, it's appalling that students are allowed to drop math after 10th standard. Uh, it's, it, it shortchanges your education in tremendous ways. I, I, I completely happen to agree with you. I completely agree. You know, you finished your undergrad studies at St. Xavier's and, you know, you went on to pursue your MS and PhD at Caltech and did your postdoc work at, you know, U Chicago. So can you 
so you know i'm really curious to know this is back in the day you know you're a 21 year old you're moving from bombay to pasadena california right 1988. so can you 1988 which is before even internet, more before smartphones yeah. and whatsapp i used to yeah, physically yeah, yeah. write letters a physically written letter every week my lord absolutely and you know i'm really curious you know back in 1988 as a young 21 year old you know can you talk about the challenges that you faced moving from mumbai to the us both in terms of culture and scientific training okay well first this whole back in 1988 you know what the 80s were the happening decade okay i mean i don't know <laughs> <laughs> I think any decade in which um in which you sort of come into adulthood you live through your teens. you think it's the greatest yeah, yeah you think that that's the happening decade so and so it was for us the 80s was totally happening um and uh I don't remember feeling um I from I remember okay I remember feeling cautious about whether I could do research. I knew I could get good grades, but I, you know, the the sense of knowing what you don't know. I knew that there was this new territory that excited me. I wanted to learn, but I didn't know if I would be good at it. So I went in with some trepidation. Um but there was also a sort of inner confidence that I will be able to figure it out. Right. Um, that inner confidence sustained me through some really low moments uh because my confidence did get chipped away it was very difficult uh to jump into a type of learning that i had not been exposed to before that i actually thrived in i enjoyed the kind of coursework that made you think the assignments that were cooked up by senior students who were the tas i thoroughly enjoyed it i just wasn't used to it Um I remember a good friend uh my batchmate Kathy Liu I remember telling her how I was struggling with this by bio, bio um by 150 was the introduction to neuroscience class and I remember we were both struggling um and I remember telling her you know this this I don't know how I'm going to manage to juggle this and my experiments and everything and she said you know Shubha it's supposed to be hard we have taken on one of the most difficult uh, study courses Uh, no it's supposed to be hard it's not supposed to be easy but that sort of calmed me that you know everything i was going through was okay so i tell students this right now that you know a phd takes 5 years why does it take 5 years because you're doing something that's really hard and a lot of it is ju- is training your mind in ways that it's not been trained before actually doing experiments doing things that don't work um it is hard and that's why it takes a while to get it all together um so academically that was the that was the struggle um in terms of being a graduate student and working in a lab i think one amazing thing about the lab culture in in the united states um or i guess one one thing about professional culture anywhere which our students in india don't experience um is what professionalism actually means it so i learned to separate the personal from the professional we don't do this in india we don't do this even in our phd labs we um bring into bear our personal issues into our professional engagements um if something goes wrong you know some experiment goes wrong or somebody drops something breaks something our cultural response is i didn't mean to do it the first thing we say is i didn't mean to do it the first thing we want is a sort of absolution that i'm not a bad person i didn't mean to do it rather than say i screwed up i'm really sorry this separation of my action from who i am this i learned in graduate school and this was actually a challenge because um interacting with people in a professional space is not something any of us are trained to do and it's in fact key i think to a successful work experience that you can you you don't have to it, it allows you the freedom to work together with and professionally engage and benefit from people who you may not be personal friends with you know if if you mix the two then you're only ever going to ask people for help um whom you like whom you're comfortable with whom you <laughs> so 
Yeah. I think in our culture, we limit ourselves to people who make us feel comfortable and who we like, as opposed to professionally, what is the best thing for this, this project? And it doesn't matter whether you like me and I like you. That's not relevant here. I think this is something that, that was completely new to me. And uh, this is, I think, something I really owe my training um, in the US for. Absolutely. And, you know, it's very important that you mentioned that, you know, you have to have an understanding of regardless of how you personally feel about someone. It's very important to separate that because you may not like somebody personally, but if they are professionally absolutely extraordinarily competent at what they do, you have to keep the personal feelings aside and, you know, figure out a way to work with them. Or and it's the same for them as well. They may not like certain things about you and, you know, but when they know that you are damn good at what you do, they have to keep their feelings aside and figure out a way to solve a problem mm -hmm. as well. And I think that's a great point that, you know, you don't understand. Do you feel that, like you said, we are not a, a confrontation uh, friendly culture that, you know, we, we, we are generally, like you said, you seek absolution at the very start, right? So do you think that it's a mindset thing where, you know, it's okay, confrontation is good. Let's hash it out as civilly as possible, but let's find a good meeting ground. I mean, we don't even have to go to confrontation, right? We don't even have to go to that word. Just simply disagreeing with somebody. Just simply disagreeing right. with somebody is all right. And even the formulation, I may not like you, but I can work with you. Why does one have to worry about liking one's work colleagues at all? Right. You know, start working for God's sake. Then later on, you meet right. them over a beer or a chai in the evening. You decide whether you want to be friends or not. But in right. work, I mean, it's work, right? As long as people are behaving civilly and courteously to each other. Um, yeah. So, so one of the lines I generally use is, you know, uh, it's very important to distinguish this fact that uh, disagreement is not disrespect. Uh, I can exactly. disagree with you on something. Exactly. That's an axiomatic problem. But just because I disagree with you on what the axiom is, it does not mean that I actually disrespect you. So, so I think it's, I think, I think, I think as a, I don't know whether our education system is even, can even train you on how to really process that in your own head. I think life sort of teaches you that right now. It's a little bit, so I, I always maintain each culture's strengths are also its weaknesses. Right. Okay, it's a contradiction. And this applies to, well, the two cultures I know well, India and the United States. Um, our society values education, values intellectual pursuit. Okay, uh, this is why everybody, if they can reasonably, uh, you know, if they have the financial uh, uh, sort of freedom to not have to work right after school, um, high school, they go to college. Everybody gets a bachelor's degree as far as possible. Um, after that, parents are very willing to support their child through a master's and a PhD because studying is good. Okay, yep. um, this is not the case in many Western countries. Only people who really want to go to college, go to college. Uh, yep. And only people who really want to, you know, sort of getting out into the real world and getting a job is sort of the order of the day. Our culture values education. It's our strength. Okay, it's also our weakness. We value it yep. so much. Okay, so all cultures, when something is very, very valuable, the dominant class hoards it. Yep. We value education so much that in our culture, only the Brahmins could have it. We hoarded knowledge and education in our caste system because we value it yep. so much. So that's a weakness because we yep. denied it to others. Right? Yep. Um, Absolutely. Uh, uh, in the US, there, um, it's not an intellectual society. To be a rocket scientist or to be a nerd or a geek has negative connotations. Right? Yep. Um, what is the strength in that then? The strength in that is simply that all professions are respected. In a yep. given family, there might be one brother who's an academician and one sister who's a, you know, a, a, a doctor and one sibling who is, you know, running an auto repair workshop. Yep. <laughs> and that sibling will probably be earning more than the others because, Absolutely. you know, respect and yep. money go together. It, you know, in the same apartment complex, you will have plumbers living next to doctors. There is no uh, financial sort of uh, class or caste in that sense. Professions are all yeah. respected. So that is the strength yep. then of not being an intellectual society. Yeah. So. It goes, it goes hand in hand that, you know, I completely agree with you. 
So come up with your Caltech and your Yushika goodies. You know, you must have had a bunch of mentors and role models to who really guided you through those uh, phases of your career. So mm-hmm. can you talk about, you know, what their influence was over your career and how you thought about neuroscience back then and how did it shape your approach to research and, you know, today where you are actually guiding a lot of graduate students and, you know, uh, those pursuing their PhDs. So can you can you talk a little bit about the influence of role models and mentors? Um, certainly. Um, I didn't know what role models and mentors were because early in my career, I didn't have any. Uh, my advisor, right. Paul Patterson, now no more. Um, he believed in letting students sort of figure things out for themselves. Uh, that was sort of the yeah. model in his lab. I didn't know that that kind of uh, approach wouldn't work, wouldn't have worked for me as well. So now I write blogs on how to, you know, choose the kind of mentor you want back. Then it was just, you know, you get what you get. Uh, So I quickly realized you have no rights in this game. You know, you're relieved if you have an advisor who doesn't, uh, 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 um, you know, disallow your intellectual and academic progress or interfere with it. Um, But a lab, a lab's environment, um, can actually be influenced by the advisor. And I don't think many advisors take responsibility for that even now. Um, Looking back, I realized I slowly created for myself um, peer mentors. I've in fact written a blog that's titled Mentorship Comes From Many Sources. A postdoc joined the lab, Karen Allendorfer, and just hearing about her career story and how she guided her career actually taught me a lot. Uh, we used to, in fact, when I moved to Chicago as a postdoc myself, we overlapped only for a year in my PhD lab. We were both kind of isolated in our research work. She, because nobody else was working on that project in my PhD lab and me, because I was the only person in my postdoc lab. So we used to do a phone journal club every week. We would read papers and discuss them over the phone. We would discuss books over the phone. Um, and this was intellectually very, um, uh, reassuring to me. Um, there was a faculty member down the hall, Peggy Mason, uh, with whom I began chatting over lunch and coffee and so on. Um, and I learned things from her. Um, over time, um, I realized that you can get, you can learn from anybody. So in fact, they don't have to be older than you or more senior than you to be your mentor. They don't even have to be your peers. You can yep. learn from how students approach things. And I have I have seriously, if you open your mind to that, your students can be your mentors. Um, I have in my lab, in TIFR, we are on first name terms. Uh, In my lab, I tell people that if you can't even call me by my first name, how are you going to tell me you disagree with me? Yeah, this goes back to something we were saying, right? This disagreement versus disrespect. Um, Over time, students learn that there is nothing they can say scientific professional that will offend me okay um over time they learn that and my students have taken me out of my comfort zone and i really have them to thank for it um, yeah so you can actually learn from anybody you can absolutely you know if you watch out for things that you don't have but you would like to and you see somebody doing it well I mean, I, I, there are, there was young master student who bounced into my lab saying, I want to learn research, but then I want to start my own biotech company. And I was like, good yeah. God, this young person knows what she wants to do. <laughs> I wasn't like that. <laughs> so. Yeah. So it comes in all, all sizes and fashions. And I think the open, to, to have an open yeah, mind absolutely. to it is the most important thing. I agree. So I think mm-hmm. uh, let's uh, jump into brain development. So, you know, uh, just given simple terms, uh, what's the focus of your research on uh, mammalian brain development and why it's crucial? Okay. Um, so the term brain development may sound, um, um, I don't know, like a self-help thing or something. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, the, the, yeah. <laughs> but development simply means what happens when one cell becomes an entire organism. That process is called development. It develops. Um, Now, brain development, neurodevelopment, is simply how the central nervous system or the brain is formed 
from a sheet of otherwise very simple cells. Okay, um, so if the brain is a computer, when you build a computer, you, you know, can assemble, well, not me certainly, but <laughs> there are people out there who can assemble an entire computer by buying motherboards and chips and things and create a computer. Yeah. Well, when you assemble the brain, you have to fabricate all the parts yourself. Hmm. When you yourself are an embryo, one cell has become two, four, eight, sixteen. 16. You have a ball of identical cells. At some point in this ball of cells, um, some part of them assemble into a sheet that is going to become the central nervous system. This sheet rolls itself up to form a tube. Okay, the, in, the inner cavity is filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And in fact, the, the spinal cord remains a tube. People who have cerebrospinal right. fluid inside the spine, it remains a tube. Yep. Now, at the top, at the top, this tube seals up and becomes the two lobes of the brain. Right. Okay. So how do, how do the cells know wh which part has to fold and become the bulgy two lobes of the brain, which part has to remain slender to form the spinal cord? Okay. In the two lobes of the brain, how are different parts of the brain um, structured? How is it that the learning and memory center is formed exactly next to where the fingernails are, right? So if I've taken the two lobes of the brain apart, okay, here's the cavity, which in the adult becomes very, not, very, very small because the, 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 there are so many neurons that they've become very thick. But how does, how does the learning and memory center, which I work on, the hippocampus form right next to the fingernails? And how does sensation, vision, hearing, and so on, exactly form in precise locations in this embryonic brain? Okay, uh, this is like a this is like a blueprint. When you design a building, okay, you know where you're going to put the plumbing, the electrical, the apartment, the kitchen. The you know where you're going to put all parts of the building, right? Um, the blueprint for the brain has been created in evolution, such that all mammals, whether it's a mouse on the street and every mouse on the street, or whether it's a giraffe or a human baby, all of us have vision, visual cortex here then sensation, touch, and so on, then motor cortex, control of movement, um, hearing is on the side, learning and memory is buried in the middle, okay, uh, and, and philosophy and, you know, higher cognition is in the front. This map yeah. is the same, okay? I mean, yeah. this, is, this is amazing, right? If you take Absolutely. a mouse's cortex, okay, this, 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 this bulgy brain, if you take this part of it and flatten it out again, the mouse's cortex is going to look like a one rupee coin, okay? If you do that for a monkey, it's going to look like a little pulki roti. Yeah. And if you do that for a human, it's going to become an extra large pizza. Yeah. Yeah. So the size yeah. of the cortex grows, but the patterning, the making which structure is going to form where happens when they're all tiny embryos. What molecules tell where to put which part? And having right. put which part wherever, you know, so this and that and the other, how do the wires connect? How do you lay in the wires? How do they know? How do the wires from the eye know that they're eventually going to have to send signal all the way to the back of the brain? How do they know yeah. where to go? I, I, I'm just very curious to know. So when all these things are being unfolded to you and when you're learning it, do you ever sit back with a sense of wonder as to how is it that as a species, uh, this process has been refined and refined to achieve this level of absolute perfection without an engineer, without a maker. And, you know, you know have, you, have you ever sat back and wondered how this, what, how it even works? Because the way you were explaining it, I'm just, you know, I could visualize it and I'm absolutely enraptured. So do you have, have you ever sat back and just wondered about that? I'm sure you have, but I'm, exci I'm absolutely excited to know how you sort of visualized it. Okay, I have two um, um, disagreements with your phrasing. Absolutely. One, yeah. it's not perfect. It is simply yeah. what we have. Right. Okay, in, in science, you always, if you wanted to test whether one drug works better than the other. Yeah. Okay, or if you want to test whether, you know, chloroquine works against malaria. You yeah. would do what we call a control experiment. You would have a yeah. bunch of mice to which you give only saline, nothing, just salt mm. water. 
um, and the other you would give your test drug chloroquine and you would ask which mice recover from malaria right yeah. well this is the only brain we have this is the only script that evolution has created it's the only blueprint we don't have a control we don't have a alternate forget control we don't have a different way of producing intelligence okay, okay? although evolution has itself tried it a few times uh, yeah. bird brains are structured differently than ours and the cognitive scientists and psychologists are discovering that birds have very complex cognitive processes called theory of mind right which were thought to be only the domain of humans right okay yeah. so there are a few variations on the theme but humans are just the most evolved but who's to say we have limitations right for example our brains do not produce computer code we cannot yeah. understand endless hierarchies of ifs and thens yeah a computer can yeah, yeah. we are our linguistic skills stop at a certain point it's not perfect but it's our brain's job to tell us all is well all is well yeah and yeah, that yeah, we're yeah. doing good and that, so it gives us the illusion of perfect so that's my first disagreement the second disagreement is that if something is very very good and complex and beautiful it necessarily has to have a maker or a creator yeah yeah, yeah. okay and i'll tell you why this disagreement um it comes no, no. from a little bit a sense of i'm i'm sorry i just interrupted you i actually i am in agreement mm-hmm. with you that there is no requirement <laughs> for a maker or a creator no, no, sure. but you ask with i wonder whether there's a maker uh, you're prompted at the age of 20 once you understand that to sort of even consider it and then like no that's just completely irrational so i'm just pushing back um, just on that yeah no so here here is why i think uh, the idea that there should be a maker is probably not um, um, viable yeah okay uh, why do we think there should be a maker i think it comes out from a good place it yeah. comes out of humility okay we humans can't possibly conceive how something so complex or beautiful could come if you look at a flower if you look at a brain if you look at anything you find um, uplifting uh, and fascinating uh, you want to say look i'm little there's no way people like me are going to have produced this there must be a higher being it comes yeah. from there right um i would say though that our ability to find something beautiful is what produces these feelings yeah. right uh, take perhaps the most beautiful pristine thing in the universe okay the most beautiful pristine thing which existed whether humans existed or not mathematics yeah okay it is seriously the most elegant clear beautiful whatever all, all of the best possible words mathematics would exist if humans were not there to admire it or try and understand it or develop it okay. okay maths didn't need a maker so why would our puny human brains need a maker right absolutely i agree in fact you know there's a famous story of feynman and his colleague who were discussing about the flower right and you know the moment i think uh, the sto- the idea of a maker comes and he says that only subtract that only subtracts from the beauty and he says that more knowledge the addition of why the color is the way it is makes things more beautiful so it's in the pleasure of finding things out and uh, i mean that I, that's I an aesthetic see, see music right i mean that we find music beautiful doesn't make the music more beautiful it's just yeah. that we find it beautiful yeah right. and and ultimately even music is uh, physics right it's the it's it's basically and just no, physics no, and no, math no 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 the the, the muse okay sound Interesting. in combinations okay. is physics and math Yeah. our perception of it our aesthetic perception of it is neuroscience right right then where does taste come from Why the taste for sounds uh, so there are some commonalities right there is research into why why we find harmonies attractive why do we find right. some sounds harmonize with each other and some are dissonant right okay right. That, that that's a percept right that's that's, yep. a, that's at the perceptual level and yeah. uh, then endless human creativity and uh, uh making the unexpected within the rules of the expected those things yeah. make uh, uh, make creative compositions attractive right right and but but i'd like I to circle it's... back to this idea that 
Please sorry. go ahead. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm so sorry. Please go ahead. So just just circling, circling back to the idea that the brain is actually not perfect. And your Feynman example of, you know, the knowledge about the flower, does it make it more? Well, let me, let me, biology is actually quite a messy system. It's not clean. Right. It's not elegant. Um, our genome is broken. All the genes that we have are not all contiguous. The coding sequences are broken up by non-coding sequences. There are genes that are broken up into a hundred little bits. And then evolution has come up with a mach machinery that when the DNA is transcribed into RNA, those bits are spliced like movie film being spliced to make yeah. a single code contiguous coding sequence. And in undergrad, when they teach you RNA splicing, they will say, this has benefits because if your gene has 10 parts, one to 10, um, you could create a new protein by using only the odd numbered ones or the even numbered ones or not using some bits. Yeah, you can create diversity. But I would say all these are post facto benefits that have evolved from a system yeah. which essentially got broken by things getting inserted and evolution couldn't remove them. You can't yeah. clean up your, you can't throw anything out unless it prevents propagation of the species. What you can do is keep adding patches and patches and hacks on top of it. Yeah. So we are yeah. one hacked up, patched up genome. Yeah. That is somehow, uh, the more biology you study, the more terrified you become. Yeah. Okay. So it's not, it's not perfect. It's not pristine. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, 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 no intelligent maker would ever design it. This yeah, way. Yeah. There is no intelligent yeah, no, design. No. The one yeah, no there. blind watchmaker no blind watchmaker that's the that's the idea <laughs> i'm i am yep. you know it's it's super interesting that you're actually saying it. so i'm going to circle back to a comment that you made and i'm i'm super interested that every time when you ask me you know, when you think about a brain the default analogy to a certain extent is imagine the computer right mm -hmm. so if i were to put you in a spot if you don't mind are there any non-computer metaphors that you can run to actually identify what the brain actually is, to use it as an example? Yeah, yeah. Um, take any motor circuit. Mm -hmm. When a neuron in the pre-motor cortex fires, it will send the neuro signal to the neuron in the motor cortex, which will send yeah. the signal to the spinal cord which will send a signal to the muscles. If you ever did reflex arc and tenth standard, the picture yeah. of the spinal cord, the neuron going to the muscle, or yeah. and then the uh, 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 a candle <laughs> flame yeah, yeah, yeah. is telling the neuron, oh, it's hot, and then your leg jerks. Yeah. Okay. Um, so all of that is a motor circuit. Um, yeah. This is not that different from any mechanical thing that, you know, when some button is pushed, something else moves down the road. Oh, right. Um, I don't right. Know a motor or a steam engine whatever 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 a car motor it's it's so all motor circuits are basically yeah there are wires but it's electrical engineering and then mechanical engineering right right see right. see this is this is the interesting um, thing you went post facto on that right like for example these these processes already existed right we then apply the framework of assuming that it is mechanical engineering or it is electrical engineering on yeah. top. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, I think yeah. the process, like you said, it doesn't it's care whether there's mechanical it. engineering. Yeah. Well, fair, yeah, yeah, yeah. fair enough. No, you asked me to, to say, is there anything that's not a computer? Yeah. Right. No, I'm, so I, as you can then, see, I'm yeah, super now thrilled. The computer part comes in. The computer part comes in, in deciding which, where you want to run. Do you right. wish to run to catch the ball? Do you wish to run away from the ball? Um, you know, do you want to say, hang this game, I'm going to go home. The computer right. part comes in there. The decision. Yeah. Seeing yeah. the ball is okay. Camera, perception, whatnot. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm very curious to know that given, you know, uh, your research work and all of that. Uh, and, and, you know, having grown up, like you said, there was a time life series that you were reading on science and, you know, uh, there is a celebration of science, scientists, and the public communication of science in the West, which I personally believe is at the foundation for mm -hmm. a lot of the West's prosperity uh, in mm -hmm. terms of scientific advancement, in terms of consumerism, in terms of econ economy, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. So given your position, uh, you know, how can we make science more, for example, 
Carl Sagan's Cosmos. My mom, for example, talks about Carl Sagan's Cosmos that used to come on Doordarshan mm-hmm. as a pretty defining moment of her understanding of science. Uh, you know, how can mm-hmm. we communicate science to our mm-hmm. audiences, our masses, our people with the same level of care, attention and strategy that, say, for example, mm-hmm. in America has actually done? Um, I think we're doing a lot of science communication already, uh, though it is sort of one off based on the passions of individual scientists. Okay, I think um, what we're not doing is at an institutional, structural, societal level. Uh, many institutions have um, science communication, um, um, you know, officers or or science communication sort of a designated job, saying that that's that's what yeah. that person will do, uh, but not not everybody. Many institutions have the occasional faculty member who has started some fantastic SciComm uh, platform. I have to mention Arnab Bhattacharya from DIFR, who started yeah. DIFR's Chai and Why some 15 yeah. years ago, uh, yeah, which, which runs twice a month uh, in very, very public culture, in the cultural heart of Mumbai, Prithvi Theatre, um, yeah. and uh, it engages with the public. Any Chai and Why audience has children from, you know, seven, seven, eight years old to, you know, bankers and <laughs> completely non-scientific people. And it's it's a wonderful series, but it's, it's no, institutional engagement. We need to, we need to value that communicating science with the taxpayers who fund our money is important. It's part of the job that we owe the taxpayer some of the excitement. Um, this needs to be valued in our promotions, in our job hirings. You know, scientists are hired based on the uh, publications they have and their research work and so yeah. on. Uh, in teaching institutions, they will be yeah, asked for a teaching statement and so on. But the, the fact that the scientists might have been putting a lot of time in public engagement is not valued. Um, and we need to be doing this in regional languages. Because after all, the language of one's Absolutely. heart is the language of one's heart. And we need to be able to... Absolutely. So, so we're not doing enough at all. Uh, but uh, we should acknowledge that many institutions have, uh, have, despite all this, done a lot, a lot of good work. And uh, perhaps and inspired my... by uh, the, 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 uh, perhaps inspired by the series you spoke about, uh, Jen Narlikar had a beautiful series about the universe. Uh, I remember seeing yeah. it when I was little. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, my fingers are absolutely crossed for this sort of a renaissance to really kick in where, uh, you know, we do, like you said, uh, take the uh, time, energy and communicate back to the public uh, all the incredible things that's that's actually Mm -hmm. going on in our labs. And speaking of lab work, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, let's just dive into some of, if you could give a brief uh, understanding and we can then take the conversation forward in whichever direction that you are comfortable you know, some of the amazing work that's actually going on in your lab at TIFR. So I think our audience is incredibly excited to understand all the great work that you've been doing. Oh, sure. Happy to. Happy to. Um, so, okay. So let's go back to the embryonic brain. Okay. The two lobes of the brain in the embryo made of the, the, the a thin sheet of cells that are all just mother cells. They're all stem cells that are simply dividing. They haven't made any neurons yet. Okay. And it's at this stage that the sheet of mother cells gets uh, instructed as to which mother cells are going to produce this or that or the other structure, neurons that belong to this or that or the other structure. So um, we stumbled upon an exciting finding. Uh, The hippocampus, not hippopotamus, okay, hippocampus, uh, it's it's, uh, Latin for seahorse, uh, is a seahorse shaped structure in humans, the human brain. Um, this handles learning and memory. The hippocampus is the recorder of memories. Okay, if for whatever reason uh, the hippocampus is removed, as it was in the very renowned case of patient H M, uh, mm-hmm. who is now no more, um, um, who had epilepsy and both sides of the hippocampus was removed, he actually had memories up until the time of the operation. But after that, he couldn't form new memories. Uh, My postdoc mentor, Liz Grove, actually interacted with him. And she said that if you went and spoke to him, he seemed like a perfectly reasonable, intelligent guy. Just said if you went out of the room and came back five minutes later, he would have no idea he'd met you. 
So you would live in a continuously shifting frame of a few minutes because you can't record the memories that you made. Okay, that's how important the hippocampus is. Um, yeah. We discovered how the hippocampus is formed exactly where it is. So we discovered these fingernails are like a strip of lighthouses. Okay, a strip lighthouse, which sends signals to the very naive mother cells next to it, mm. such that cells that receive the strongest signal become hippocampus and cells that don't receive the strong signal become other brain structures. Okay, other brain structures, very important. Okay, yeah. uh, the cognition, the, the sensor sensation, the motor processing and so on. But learning and memory, the center forms right next to the fingernails. And in fact, different parts of the hippocampus form sort of at different distances from this signal from the lighthouse. You can imagine a lighthouse sending signals in the sea and you have a whole bunch of boats at different distances that don't have any flags yet, no identity. And then the ones that see the strongest signal turn up the red flag. And the ones that see medium signal turn up the green flag. And the ones that see weakest signal turn up blue flag. And those are your different uh, sort of parts of the hippocampus. Right? Um, so we discovered this signaling center and we showed that these fingernails really do send this instructive signal by creating a mouse, okay, by some genetic wizardry, in which this fingernail lighthouse was here and here and in places where it shouldn't be. And wherever it was, wherever we created it, a hippocampus came next to it. Wow. So that showed very conclusively that this is the organizer for the hippocampus. It's the lighthouse that tells the hippocampus where to be. Now, how does this um, help? Well, this is understanding how the blueprint of the brain is actually formed. Okay, there are no mutants in which the hippocampus is sitting on the other side. Right. Okay, there, su such mutations don't survive because yeah. in order for that mechanism to get messed up, very many other fundamental mechanisms would go awry and that yeah. embryo would not survive. Yeah. So this is sort of fundamental. How does the brain exist the way it is? And then layer on top of that, you can then ask, okay, now these mother cells that are right next to the fingernails know they're going to become hippocampal or they're going to make neurons of the hippocampus. How do they do so? Okay, um, all these mother cells make three completely different types of cells. They will first make neurons, they will keep dividing. Then they will make a neuron and a copy of the mother cell, a neuron and a copy of the mother cell, and a neuron and a copy of the mother cell. And then they will stop making neuron. They will make something called a glial cell, a support cell. Yeah. Okay, its technical name is the astrocyte, like it looks yeah. like a star. Yeah. These cells support neurons and so on. And then after they're done making astrocytes, they will make a cell that is also a glial cell that produces myelin, the lipid that yeah. wraps around the nerve fibers to insulate them. Yeah, the sheet. Literally, you can't have wires without insulation, yeah. otherwise the signal would dissipate. So all of this, so remember I said that you have to make all your parts when you make the computer, biological computer. Yep. So here are this mother cell. At different times in this mother cell's life, it's dividing and producing a copy of itself and a neuron, a copy of itself and an astrocyte, a copy of itself and now a myelinating oligodendrocyte. It's produced. So this mother cell is, is it the same mother cell through time? What changes in the DNA of this mother cell? Now, all our cells have the same DNA. Okay, our skin cell, Dolly the sheep was made from a skin cell. Yep. Right? The DNA is the same. So it's like the library of books is the same in every cell in our body. But some books are tied up into inaccessible shelves. You know, this uh, compact shelving where the whole shelves are compressed and you can't get a book out of them yep. unless you move the shelves aside yep. and create an aisle. Yep. So this happens to DNA. This happens to DNA. In different cell types, in different mother cells, some of the books are tied up and you can't access them. So you can only access books, information that is available to you. So for example, if you're making a, a, a red blood cell, okay, the mother cell that's gonna make the red blood cell is gonna be able to access the gene for hemoglobin because it's gonna to have to. The red blood cell needs hemoglobin. No other cell goes and looks at the book for instructions on how to make hemoglobin. <laughs> okay. Yep. Uh, so how do these mother cells change their DNA accessibility? 
how do they control which books are available for their daughter neuron or astrocyte or oligodendrocyte to read, to be a neuron or astrocyte or oligodendrocyte. That is actually the current kind of work we're doing today. And that's where my fantastic team of students and postdocs are addressing very challenging molecular biology, neuroscience and development problems. That's, uh, that's really interesting. So I think uh, the way that you have described it is in a very, very natural sort of a setting, right? Where it is for the, uh, where it is like for the regular human being. But when you, when you were to take certain mutations that were to occur that results in say certain disorders, right? Like an Alzheimer's or something like that. How does uh, <coughs> how does this process really change when those sort of I don't know if I'm using the word correctly, but when those sort of mutations really hit you? Um, you've actually really led me to an interesting part of the future of this kind of work. Um, how does this kind of work help people today? Okay, uh, when different parts of this process go wrong. Um, when certain genes are mutated, you get disorders. So one gene that we are looking at is a transcription factor called LHX2. What is a transcription factor? It's a protein that binds different parts of DNA selectively, different genes, and turns their expression on and off. Right. So in some sense, it allows the books to be opened and read or not. Yep. Um, we found that this particular transcription factor is key in controlling in the hippocampus whether the cells will make neurons or whether they will make astrocytes. Okay. Um, in other parts of the brain, this transcription factor is key in controlling the arbors of the neuron. So a neuron is like a cell with input wires and an output wire. Now, the shape of this input wire, it's like an arbor of a tree. It's going to control how the neuron functions because it's going to control the reach of the neuron, how it integrates information. So knock out this transcription factor, the arbor changes. Okay, now, um, recently, uh, we um, um, were asked to review a paper, which has now uh, been published, Schmidt and colleagues, mm -hmm. in which they identified 16 human patients with mutations in this transcription factor. Right. Okay, and they found that the end result is microcephaly, a shrunken brain, mental retardation, autism, okay, a range of brain disorders when this transcription factor is mutated. Right. So the genes that we study in the mouse that have very fundamental functions, um, when they are mutant in humans, they actually have profound uh, effect on the human uh, ability to function. So these studies have a direct connect. And, uh, you know, I'm super interested in understanding that, you know, let's say that you take it one step further, which is let's say that we have an understanding of how these things. So so let me, let me sort of just come back one step and I'm sort of trying to process it myself, which is there is an understanding phase and then there is a translation phase, right? where you're able to sort of understand, you're able to model, you're able to replicate, and then it sort of goes into publishing, it's peer reviewed mm -hmm. or something. And once that establishment, once it's established that this is the method, this is the process, to, I know it's imperfect, but this is our closest approximation of what happens, right? How do you move into the translational phase of really supporting people who and have the, you know, who are, who, who, who have sort of got these unfortunate sort of uh, situations that they have to deal with. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm being sensitive um, in my language. So yeah. it's, no, you, usually it's difficult for one lab to do everything. Right. Okay. Uh, it's the process has to be broken up. So we collaborate. Right. We are right now in discussion with a team of um, physicians um, in, in uh, um, uh, Slovenia who have identified humans that carry a mutation of a different gene we're interested in, beta catenin. Right. Okay. So they have access to MRI of these patients. So we collaborate and they don't, uh, 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 they're not expert in the biology of this molecule and what it does. So we make the mutation in the mouse and we study it. We collaborate with people who look at human patients and that's how you um, achieve end to end sort of studies. Yeah. 
not all studies have to have this, right? You can publish a study with fundamental science, or you can publish a study with the clinical findings. And then over time, somebody ties it together. Right, right. And we're not even talking about, uh, you know, drug drug discovery and yeah. pharma and so on. That's sort of an add-on at the very end of the sequence. Yeah. And so it's, know, it's a long, it's a very vast spectrum. I, and there are contributions to be made at every every stage. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm, I'm also super curious to know that, you know, how do you keep, there's almost like a macro and a micro, right? Like you said that the macro is that, you know, maybe this is the vision, maybe this is not the vision, but it's like, okay, we understand that there are these certain challenges that are there. If we actually have the right close approximate model as to how this works, it can move into something potentially life-changing for a lot of people who suffer from these things. And then at the micro level, it's like you said, you're doing that one part of that collaboration with another university, like you said, in Slovenia, another lab in Slovenia. So how do you actually balance the macro and the micro of how you're actually trying to create this kind of impact? Um, each project has a life of its own. So you start a project by asking a very precise question. You set up experiments, you discuss with the student or postdoc who's doing it, whether they would like to follow this. So in, in my lab, I uh, give new students a starter project, but it's very clear that I will work very hard to basically allow them to design the project to look at what they are interested in. Right. Uh, you know, it, it, it has to excite them enough that, you know, they wake up thinking, oh, what am I going to do today? Uh, so I work very hard to try and tailor the project to what the person actually wants to do. It's their time. It's their life that they're investing in this. Um, and you have to have a precise hypothesis. You have to have experiments, controls that you look at the data. And then you ask how, which direction you can take this in. Is it going to be one that sends you to elab look through a whole genetic pathway. It's not enough to just look at one gene. What does it regulate? What does it control? What, what is the downstream cause? Is there something within a cell that uh, is not working properly? Is there something that's within the arbor that's not working properly? You, you let the data inform how it goes. You don't plan it ahead. Right, right. And then if you find something um, where, so for example, one of our mutants, um, doesn't make very much cerebrospinal fluid. And we found that shocking that this mouse is alive. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, and then we found there are humans walking around with these mutations. So they have cerebrospinal fluid. So probably the mutation in humans is not fully penetrant. Um, but um, this study, this study um, uh, led by two of my former students, Arpan Paricha and Varun Suresh, this study actually shows that these mutations that humans carry could be affecting the quality of the cerebrospinal fluid in the brain, which had not been thought of before. In our mouse, we have an extreme case where there is zero CSF, but surely in the mutant humans, there'll be something wrong with the CSF, even though it's there. And maybe that could be the reason for some of the problems that these patients manifest. So that's how the idea comes that, hey, you know, this connection can be made, which wasn't made before. Right. Right. I'm, I'm super curious to know that given your vantage point of being a very seasoned researcher, somebody who's working with a lot of young people, you know, working on active research in these parts of the human brain, you know, I'm very curious to know that, you know, how does your, how has your extensive research shaped your understanding of human behavior and, you know, how we make decisions every day? I'm, I'm very curious to know from your vantage point. Well, okay. I don't work on behavior. I work on how the uh, brain is constructed yeah. and behavior is a consequence. Right. It's a natural yeah. consequence. Yeah. Right? But naturally we, uh, we are motivated and inspired by brain function. The, 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 we study the circuitry that produces function. Yeah. Um, well, it makes learning neuroscience makes you realize not to take yourself too seriously. You realize how the brain is doing the best it can with at the one, you know, on the one hand, there's information overload. There are so many images, sounds, everything coming in everywhere we go. Okay. The retina is, it's got a refresh rate. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The reason, yeah, the reason, the reason uh, uh, movie films work is they take advantage of the retina's refresh, refresh rate. They show you images, still images so fast that the retina thinks that there is a, that the eye thinks that there's a motion, like a yeah. flip book. 
right? So we are, we are, when we go to a movie, we are voluntarily lending ourselves to, you know, saying, come on, treat me to a visual illusion. And I will believe that there are people moving on the screen. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So on the one hand, there is too much information and the retina is doing the best it can. Now, even there, while the retina is picking up the entire image, when that information is transmitted to the visual cortex, it is very selectively transmitted. Only the center of vision, the fovea, where the photoreceptors are very dense, only those parts have high resolution. So we create a good, rich picture of the world by foveating over it. Okay. If we are just looking straight, we really only see what our fovea covers and the rest of it is kind of vague. But the brain's job is to tell you that you think you've seen the whole world. Okay. The brain gives you this illusion that all is well. You've seen everything. When what you've done is quickly foveated over different parts of the, the field of view and patched it together, there are these videos where uh, people are doing something on a table and you're really focused on that. And what you realize later is that the color of their t-shirts has changed 20 times and you didn't notice. Yeah. <laughs> because, right, it's been in your yeah, field yeah, of yeah. view and you didn't notice because your attention was. So the point is, when you're attending to something, you're processing information from it. If you're not attending to something, it's kind of lost. Yeah. Okay, there is no Jedi recall. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a database of everything you've ever seen and you can yeah. go into a trance and it doesn't yeah. happen. So this poor brain circuits overloaded with information are taking things that you have attended to. Okay, um, if there's a crowded party and you're focusing on one conversation, you're hearing that and you're not hearing somebody next to you saying fire, 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 or this vada pao is delicious habit. You've tuned it out yep. because you're focusing on one conversation, right? So, and yet, the, you know, the brain cannot let you feel that you have no idea what's going on. Right. It's the brain's job to tell you that you're on top of everything. Okay. It makes you realize you're kind of not, right? Yeah, yeah. It makes you realize, you know, this whole eyewitness testimony. You remember only what you want to remember. You remember only things that have emotion attached to them. You don't, you know, I remember very clearly you said this. Well, you know. Always little, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We are, we are, I mean, the, you know, I, I say this in class. The next time we are like heavily invested in something, but this is this. You know, your brain did the best it can. It's not perfect by any stretch. Slightly lighten up. Yep. So as a neuroscientist, it's taught me not to take anything humans do, including myself, that seriously, because we're all struggling along, managing with a computer that's trying to tell us we're on top of things. I'm super curious. I think we spoke about real people. Let's take a fictional person. So I'm sure you must have read Sherlock Holmes growing up. So there's the memory palace that Sherlock uses to recall very key bits of information and details. So when you look at something like a fictional, like I'm, I'm super curious. So for example, when I see science fiction movies and they're like really cool interfaces, my mind sort of goes in or very cool products or something that my mind naturally goes into sort of understanding, okay, how might, how might they have built that? If I were to build this, how might I have built this? So when you were reading Sherlock's recall now, like for example, putting you in the spot right now, were you ever curious to think about how he sort of had that kind of recall where you know that it's not perfect, but his recall is somehow perfect? Um, let, let's talk about a different piece of science fiction instead. Yeah. Okay. I think science fiction is fabulous. It's in fact one of my most favorite reading genres yeah. because it removes the constraints of what is practical or possible or, you know, feasible yeah. or real. And it allows wild human creativity. Yeah. Okay. So science fiction, for example, um, predicted the flip cell phone long before we had any form of cell phone, anything, any form of telephone. Yeah. Right. The Star Trek communicators yeah. were exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe our cell phones were modeled on those yeah. Star Trek communicators. Science fiction, um, 20 years old, Bruce, old Bruce Willis film, The Surrogates. Mm -hmm. Okay, based on a little bit of neuroscience research, but um, it presaged bionic arms and things that are, uh, so, so I think sci-fi is, is, is the way human creativity sort of lays out things that are possible. And then science and technology comes along and makes some of them possible. Yeah, it's, it's really cool that you said that because I remember 
reading a collection of essays from uh, the writer uh, Neil Gaiman. And, uh, you know, he has this incredible collection of essays called The View from the Cheap Seats. So he spoke about this uh, experience he had of going to China. And uh, he was, I think, with a member from the government. And, you know, he asked them, how is it that China has <coughs> managed to achieve so much of science and technology proficiency in such a short period of time? And apparently the mm-hmm. CCP executive uh, who was working with uh, Gaiman basically went back and said that because we attacked the problem at its root, we went and we captured the arts. So they were doing so much of public communication of science that it basically created two, three generations of people who wanted to be doctors and engineers. Wow. wow. So okay. I, that story has I mean, consistently stayed with me. So when you said about sci-fi, I mean, it really took me yeah. back there. So, yeah. So, I mean, so going back to your Sherlock Holmes thing, whether or not a memory palace is possible and so on, and whether somebody is better at remembering, I mean, there are techniques to improve your memory and yeah. so on. But I think the whole purpose of that, that, that I think that whole series, um, I think that whole series gave us that despite our inadequate imperfections, logical reasoning is possible. Yeah. And here is how you can, you know, it gave us, it gave us that. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, I just want to move to the next section of our discussion and I'm super, super excited, which is, uh, you know, given that you are running uh, the Tode Lab out of uh, TIFR right now, I'm very curious to know that, you know, uh, how do you assess the current state of uh, neuroscience research in India? You know, what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses that you actually see in this right now? Mm-hmm. Okay, so thank you. This is something close to my heart. Um, I think Indian neuroscience is fledgling, growing, but not at the rate it could and should because we don't teach it at undergrad level. Mm-hmm. Neuroscience is not, if you don't include something in undergrad, uh, generations of students come out thinking, oh, it's a specialized subject. Mm-hmm. So. Um, for example, India is very good at teaching biochemistry and genetics, yep. which is why Indians who want to go to grad school typically go to <laughs> biochemistry. You know, you, 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 undergrad is a place where students' minds seem to be very open and whatever is thrown at them, they'll, okay, it's fine. I have to learn it. By the time they come to grad school, there is a little bit of, oh, but that's not my line. I'm uncomfortable with it. I don't know. So a lot of my initial grad lectures are in fact about saying neuroscience is basically cell biology of neurons or biochemistry of neurons. It just happens to be one cell in the body, right? And just because you weren't introduced to to it as an undergrad doesn't mean now it is some new thing. It's not more difficult. It is not more complex. It is just a field that you weren't introduced to. So if we include neuroscience as at the undergrad level, we would be doing uh, the field a great favor. We'd be doing the students a great favor. Um, At the research level, though, Indian science has a lot of challenges, not specifically neuroscience, but broadly Indian science. Um, There is funding, but the way it comes, okay, you write a project proposal, a grant, you get approved, but then the first year money will come, the second year and third year will not come on time. The funding cycle is erratic. There is no funding cycle. Um, This applies not only to grants, but it applies to student salaries. So TIFR students are protected. They are paid by funds from the Department of Atomic Energy, fellowship funds, which come on time. So thank goodness TIFR students have never had to wait for their funding. Um, But most students who are funded by other uh, JRF and SRF fellowships, they have to wait for months. And then they get arrears and we assuage ourselves uh, that, oh, but they're getting the money. But, you know, they might get the money eight months later, but what do they eat for those eight months? And forget what they eat. I mean, that's important, but think about what you're doing to their minds. You're treating them like they don't matter, that nobody really cares about them. And those are the people who are going to carry forward the torch of Indian science. You've told them at the young stage that it doesn't matter to pay you on time. We don't really think that, you know, yeah, you're important enough to take up this cause. Uh, I mean, how, how a culture treats its youngest people is really a measure of that culture. And I think we're doing badly. So students don't get paid on time broadly. Grants don't come on time. How do we expect to be competitive with 
people in the rest of the world whose grants do count. Okay, then let's get to the content of the actual grant. It is reasonably easy to get money to buy equipment. Okay, when I say easy, yeah, you have to write a scientific proposal and so on. But um, the powers that be like to see an equipment with a label on it. Okay, this facility was built. Fine, you've bought this Mercedes, but what about the trained staff to operate it? Their Indian science is terribly shortchanged because we cannot pay people enough to be really, you know, advanced, skilled, high-end operators who manage the whole facility. Okay, and here is where this whole intellectual culture thing comes in. Everybody wants a PhD. Everybody wants to call themselves professor. Okay. Managing a facility is regarded as a lower job by the people who are training for it and by the, the structure of our government sort of designations where you can't pay people enough what they deserve. They should be paid like professors. There are, you know, there, there are, there are uh, genome facility managers or imaging facility. Imaging has reached such a high engineering level now. There are imaging facilities sort of in charges who earn more than professors earn and well, they should outside the country. Here, we don't have that. So you hire somebody at a you know junior level with the right degree or whatever. They train for a couple of years on your equipment. Then they go to some industry or some company that's willing to pay them what they deserve. And as a result, you have this fantastic equipment, you know, these really high end. Uh, imagine a Mercedes where there is no actual Mercedes repair shop. Right. And your PhD students have to learn from scratch how to operate the machine, how to get data from it. And then when they leave, you know, the younger ones have to take over. This is no way to squander the talent uh, of the country. So in terms of funding, timely release, in terms of facilities, infrastructure, and the, the respect for the people who manage them, we need these things, okay? Um, without these, we're not going to be able to be competitive. Everybody who's done it has done it as firefighting all the time. Yeah. We're continuously sort of running to keep in the same place. And then there is another element of uh, um, Indian grants that is very limiting. Um, international travel is regarded as, um, you know, people going abroad to, I don't know, have fun maybe. It's limited. In fact, most DBT, DBT, DST grants don't have it, except for their prize fellowships. There is no budget head for international travel. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not international travel is now par for the course. If you cannot go to meetings and showcase your stuff and say, hey, here, you know, I'm working on this and hey, let's collaborate. If you can't meet people in the entire international community, if you can't be part of that community, if a student in their entire five years is entitled to DBT or CSIR funding to go abroad once, I mean, you're never going to be able to play on an international platform. If you can't continue to present yourself as, hey, I'm there, I'm a player, you know. So for these reasons, for these reasons, Indian science is not going to reach its potential for nothing to do with the scientists, the ideas, the students, that's all there. But it's timely release of funds and student salaries, uh, facilities and trained staff who can be paid enough to run them properly so that students don't have to and international engagement. These three things we so simply don't recognize. Thank you so much for that answer. It don't hit know all. How to solve it. These are the problems. No, I think, I think uh, the first step to solving any problem is actually acknowledging them. And I think the three points that you raised are often, you know, we always talk about talent as a problem, which I always found very weird. Like, you know, everybody who talks saying that, hey, all the top folks are going, I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's the, I don't think that's the, you know, it's like, you know, they say, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not causal, right? So how do you really... Talent and I, ideas are not the limitation. Absolutely. I actually completely agree. And I think the points that you touched on, the release In of In fact, funds, you drive scientists, you drive out. scientists into doing safe science. Yeah. You drive safe science, survival science, because if you don't know if the second year's funding is going to come, you don't know when you're going to be able to travel out to, you know, get any, get interactions with who else might be working on. You're going to be doing something safe. Yep. You're not going and, to be taking the risks. And, and I it's think, uh, tragic. And, I, and I, and I hope that, you know, down the line, you know, whoever's working on these policies, 
really understand that these are the nuts and bolts that actually keep everything together and we can build a these are the foundations on which we can build a glorious house so i think uh, let's i'm really thankful for your answer on that uh, this is this is a little bit of a fun segment so i just want to know your you know we've spoken about development we've spoken about intelligence we've spoken about sensations we've talking about we've spoken about you know perceptions i'm very curious you know, like we are now <laughs> in uh, you know if you ask a young person they they their entire life is like you know before chat gpt and after chat gpt right if they are preparing for something or if they are writing something or if they are asking something so it's almost like pre gpt post gpt and given again that you know given your understanding of development and you know you given extraordinary talks about sensation and perception all these things i'm very curious to know how would you compare the uh you know the uh, the stitched patchwork human intelligence that had that has evolved over so many you know such so many such millennia versus uh computation intelligence so i'm very curious to know how would you perceive it so okay i know very little about the whole ai ml space within which chat gpt is a small part um i would very uh, carefully just apply a turing test if you can't tell the difference then like if if answers coming out of a box are produced by chat gpt or you know a human and you can't tell the difference then how do you label something as intelligent versus not or artificial or whatever right that's actually super I, interesting because you have to be able to yeah sorry go ahead i'm so sorry yeah go ahead no no go ahead no that's actually super curious because i think one of the reasons why gpt has in you know really captured people's minds and freaked people out at the same time is because if you ask a question and you prompt it correctly the answers are almost like at that quality of uh you know uh, a rational agent really putting in those questions and you know there are many ways that you can actually play with the turing test so for example if i even uh incorrectly phrase certain questions you know willfully right to understand if the agent has sort of understood the actual question i'm trying to pose deciphered the errors in my message responded with the fact that i have asked the question incorrectly and then answered the question i intended to ask correctly that's the part of the turing test where it gets likely freaky whether you have actually thought of uh, nailed the response or not but i let me take it in another direction if it is okay do you believe that there is a construct that is actually called the do you believe that the mind is a real thing or if it's a construct because this has bugged me for like 10 years so i'm just asking you i don't know i don't have um i don't have the words to sort of discriminate the different parts of that answer yeah okay but i will so okay i i will say a couple of things okay i don't think we have to worry as much about llms large language models chat gpt and so on though i mean okay some of the answers right now sound hopelessly drippy yep yeah and sort of random word salad uh it'll get better it'll get better i think the logical end point of all of this and where we should really worry is that nobody knows nobody has any idea of the circuitry for morality for being a good person for doing the right thing okay why did evolution when it created our kind of intelligence or the bird kind of intelligence or whatever um did evolution select for a set of circuitries that have an inbuilt morality do the right thing kind of function in them and if so then we are in big danger because the ais coming out there would not have had those constraints okay um this has been brought out very nicely in this film ex machina yep yep wonderful film yeah so yeah so when we meet another human being 
yeah, there are cultural differences and we will go on about how, you know, some culture is uh, um, very particular about being exact in terms of whatever timing or legally some culture is very, very, you know, whatever, um, focused on being very uh, careful and polite and so on. Some cultures, we focus on the differences, yeah. but broadly we have an assumption when we interact with another human being that this person is a decent, normal human being, that this person has morality, that they will help us if we ask for help, that they have no reason to guide us the wrong way if I say which is the direction to this hotel or that hotel. We approach human beings with this. Okay, now there are bad human beings who don't have these traits. Okay, but we expect the normal condition to be one that has a moral compass. And one can only assume this moral compass has been selected for by evolution. And yep. that is potentially the point at which artificial intelligence may be at its most terrifying. Yep. Even when Isaac Asimov wrote his um, um, robot series, yep. he came up with three laws that gave the robots morality yep. of some kind, okay, a set of laws to behave by, um, do, you know, do not harm and so forth. I think, I think that is incredibly... So, I think it's incredibly thoughtful as a response because one one area where I will sort of, I don't know if disagree is the right word, but where I might rephrase a certain idea is that yes, morality within the LLM is mm. super important given that we know while the quality of the output is not at par with a trained expert, right? Uh, however, when it comes to ideas of morality, having one soul LLM that really determines and dominates what morality is. And when you have people encoding it within the system, rather than that being evolved and chosen for amongst a myriad of LLMs that are actually out there, uh, I feel that, you know, being intelligent in developing morality in LLM is actually dangerous because you are prone to putting out what your own biases are. For example, the morality of the West in certain ideas. Yeah. yeah might contradict, not even Indians, might contradict the Japanese, for example. Yeah. So being, I, I think, I think, let, I mean, let there be a thousand LLMs. Human, human morality was Sorry? Let there be a thousand LLMs is the way I am actually seeing it. The, oh, yes, they're all developing very fast. Yes. Right. Human evolution took its time and broadly all humans are the same. I mean, yeah. we keep elaborating on our differences, but broadly all humans are the same. Absolutely, um, absolutely. This, 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 this is not going to be, and whether they have morality is going to be an issue, right? Why yeah. is, I mean, there will be, you know, a do-it-yourself LLM hacker, AI hackers, yeah. who will produce, uh, you know, entire More, AI species. Yeah. And don't feel yeah. the need to put in morality, morality. I mean, I'm not worried about whether this, this or that or the other country's yeah. morality. I'm yeah. worried about their being morality. Yeah, I there is no a, compulsion for an AI to have it. Is all I'm saying. I completely agree because I think the morality. I think morality is something that is perceived, that is evolved, that comes with time. Despite our differences, it's one of our commonalities, right? Yeah. The idea that you can expect a machine and, to you know not maybe have the a soul. word morality is a little bit overused, yeah, yeah. bastardized. I mean, maybe the word yeah. morality may turn people off. Let us just talk of good human beingness, right? Yep, decency. Let's let's substitute morality with decency. Yeah, humaneness. No reason for me, I yeah. Be decent. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And um, you know, speaking I of, I into some pro, some movie. Yeah. Sorry. No, please go ahead. Which movie? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just remembering some movie where there was a um, um, interactive AI. What was it? What was it? Two thousand one, A Space Odyssey. Um, no, 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 no. A guy who had a relationship with an AI. Oh, her. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Walking sure, Phoenix. Sure. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And and at some point, uh, sorry, thrill, spoiler alert, but at some point he realizes that she's having that level of nuanced uh, conversation and a deep relationship with 1,388 other people or some yeah. such <laughs> number. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So, Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, you know, since you're speaking about humaneness, I'm super curious to know what advice you might have for young people being a seasoned scientist 
having been a young person yourself, you know, given your position right now, how would you sort of <coughs> think about, you know, what advice would you give young people today? Um, don't limit yourself. Whatever your constrictions, the constraints and restrictions you think are, um, are there to be flattened by you. Keep the fire of whatever it is you really cherish. Keep it alive inside you. Immediately right now, you may not have the resources to do whatever you, you know, think you want. You may not know what you want. You may feel constrained and not know what you're constrained about. But keep the fire alive. And, you know, given that, you know, the fire is alive, how do you seek inspiration to go forward and build a career that really lasts not five papers, not 10 papers, not a professorship, but a career that's actually defined by a legacy rather than, you know, just a chair? You don't set out to make a legacy, right? You, 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 it's a little bit like, I guess, characters in the Mahabharat, at each point in their lives, everybody is doing what they think is the right thing to do for them at the time. So take each step in a considered fashion. If you have goals that you value, don't lose sight of them. And legacy will build. So, and then, you know, and, when, when you develop gray hair, somebody will interview you <laughs> and ask you questions about how you plan your <laughs> Lovely. Oh, lovely. And, you know, before we jump into the last section, I have one last question. And this is something which I believe is very, very close to your heart, which is encouraging young women into STEM. I'm being extremely specific. Young women in STEM. You know, uh, what advice would you give young women to pursue a career in neuroscience or other scientific fields. May I may I focus on the young women part? What what advice I would give to young women, period? Absolutely, please. Yeah, it's okay if they don't want to do STEM. It's okay if they want to do, I don't know, I mean, history. My my son, my older son, Abhay, is a history major in Ashoka mm -hmm. and passionate about Kathak dance. Uh, has been learning for 17 years and performed his first solo Rangmanj Pravesh. So it's, it's, my advice is have the courage to have a dream. Um, I think young women are asked not to have dreams. Uh, I've, I've actually, there's a YouTube video um, in which I've spoken on this for 15, 20 minutes uh, yeah. on how young girls are asked to compromise their dreams. Because in some unspecified future stage in your life, you will be married into a family which will have those constraints on what it is you want can do. So better not have a dream. Then that way you can, a friend of mine said this very, very, very heartbreakingly, and I don't think she realized at the time, um, but it broke my heart. She said, I have the absence of a dream. And in there, I will fill whatever dreams I know I can surely have. Jeez. This broke my heart. But this is actually, she articulated what girls are implicitly brought up to do. Not make plans. I mean, okay, young people don't always have plans. Even men don't have plans. But they have this innate sense of, I'll figure it out. I don't have a plan yet, but I'll figure it out. Um, girls are not allowed this, I'll figure it out. They're told, whatever you do, remember, you will have to bear you know, the, the brunt of managing your family, uh, your children, you will have a biological clock. I mean, what girl is there in the universe who doesn't know she has a biological clock? But the number of people who tell us about it. I mean, the, the, the broadly, the number of advices girls get. Okay, uh, I note you're perplexed because guys don't get this. People tell women what to do all the time, continuously. You should this, you should this, you should this. All through life. Uncles, aunts, men and women will give girls advice. Uh, there is, there is, boys are allowed to be. But a girl, you should, you should, you should. Ask the girls how, how often they've been heard the word you should. Nobody really bothers or dares to tell boys this because they'll just say, you know, well, I'm 
I'm I'm so sorry. I'm laughing because I know it's so true. <laughs> that is why, like, like you try telling a young guy But do this, and he'll just laugh at you, and he'll go and play or something like that. Yeah, no, I completely yeah. agree. Girls yeah. don't have the confidence. The number of you should, you should, you should, you should, you should. Yeah. Okay, you have to be a serious mutant to grow up to actually still keep your dreams inside you to not hear the continuous you shoulds. Uh, there are a few such mutants. I've met them. I'm one of them. Uh, develop a thick skin. The number of, I mean, you know, parents will opine on how long a girl should keep her hair. Yeah. Okay. society opines on whether you should oh how long your skirt should be how long where i mean you know a girl can't just sit around on a you know a city sort of um, bus station and just look at people yeah guys do it all the time girls can't just sit and look oh my god where the ones that get looked at yeah. right so there is this continuous imposition on girls right from a young stage and my advice to girls is you know this is not good for you yeah. be as immune to it as possible yeah keep your own thing inside you you can't change the world but you can change how you deal with it yeah and have a dream have the confidence to say i'll figure it out because you will and if there is a partner in your life you want somebody who won't place constraints on you you don't want to be married into a family where they have opinions on what you should do and yeah you have a biological clock but you know it you don't need anybody to tell you after a certain age it becomes hard i mean come on everybody knows what their biology is telling them right you don't need people to tell you this so filter it all out do what you want have the courage to i think that's a that's a beautiful note to run into our uh, rapid fire segment so professor tony thank you so much for being a part of the inductive economy and that's a beautiful message i think not just to young women but to young people and old people parents and everyone because it's encompassing in its scope and let's hope that you know we become uh, more open minded more considerate and more understanding in how we nurture and shape young people's hopes and dreams going forward so now we are in the rapid fire section so my first question it's it's all you on the spot let's go there are no hampers i can't <laughs> promise anything big so uh my first question to you is what is one piece of advice you would give your younger self dare more amazing what are some books that have changed the way you think and engage with the world two books i read in school one was mr god this is anna okay the author was a pseudonym thin f y n n um life insights from the mouth of a 4 year old girl and okay. they just resonated with me everybody should be that free it seemed to define freedom in a child right right she had thoughts on everything um and beautiful thoughts and the other along the same lines uh, jonathan livingston seagull by richard buck again a seagull epitomizing um, following Freedom. you know his own dreams yeah yeah separate from the flock yeah uh, wanting a life more than diving for bits of food yeah beautiful beautiful what's your go to method for overcoming procrastination or writer's block huh <laughs> procrastinate i don't have a solution just bite the bullet and do it at the end of the day you have to do it and you'll spend the same amount of time doing it now or 10 hours of procrastination later so you might as well save yourself the angst and do it now extremely 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 practical if you had to condense your life philosophy into one sentence what would it be um to make my time count beautiful way that's it's a beautiful beautiful idea so shobha my next question is what's the most valuable piece of advice you you ever received and who gave it to you um okay this is my 
mom. She never actually gave me this advice. She gave me a lot of advice, but not this. This is something I've extracted from just growing up as the daughter of Aruna Tole. Um, she passed away 10 years ago. Um, and in a couple of months, I'm going to bring out a book she wrote about occupational therapy that describes her own life and her contributions. Um, so I've been very much with her right now. And I think what I extracted from her example, just her lived example, is that one should never let one's job description limit what one does in life. Amazing. The job description is just a label. What you do can be so much more. I mean, you, Vignesh, are doing so much more than what your job description is. <laughs> this, this, this forum is completely beyond the description. For students, the translation is don't let the syllabus be the upper limit of what you learn. The syllabus is the lower limit. You can read much, much more. There is, and, and as a scientist, I think I have the most privileged job. I'm paid to learn and read anything I want to. That's actually my privilege that I can, I can, tomorrow I can read about gravity. Day after I can read about how elements formed in the universe. Uh, you know, today I'm working on a neuroscience paper with my student. I have the privilege of learning whatever I want. I mean, that's that sort of, in some sense, I've chosen a profession that followed my mother's unstated but exemplar of not letting a job description limit what one does in life. So, Shubha, I think that's a lovely note to end our conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time and uh, being here with me, being here with Thank our audience. Thank you very, very much. And I hope you had a great time. I found this to be an absolutely insightful conversation and I think it's going to stay with me for a very long time. Thank you. That's extremely kind of you to say, and it's 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 been an uh, unusual privilege, unusual opportunity to talk with you.